Friends, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce your next speaker. Uh, this guy has produced thousands and thousands of hours of content, uh, educational, informative, and uh, at times entertaining for DJs. Uh, his, uh, his charitable giving uh, extends far beyond what he does just for the industry. I have a particularly uh, favorite story. Uh, I was out on the road uh, doing, you know, nerd work stuff, and I had my son with me who was, I think, 11 at the time, and it was his birthday. And uh, hanging out with dad doing nerd work stuff on your birthday isn't always cool. So this guy actually took my son out to Dave and & Buster's, and they had a great time. Uh, again, just a, a charitable heart. And I also get the pleasure every Tuesday of being his warm-up act. Uh, my show appears right before his on uh, Tuesday night on Disc Jock News. So uh, without any further ado, please give a warm welcome to my friend, Brian Red. Anybody know that song? Anybody? Well, I told a few people what it was, but that is the Peter Tom Sound Orchestra. It's called The Big Boss, and it's the theme song for the Bruce Lee movie Fist of Fury, 1971, his first film. Now, the reason I picked that song, and you didn't really hear the intro, play that intro again. Just, just do it one more time. There it is. Okay, you can kill it. Okay, I picked that song for two reasons. First reason is it's one of those songs that grabs you right away because the intro is unique. I mean, this is Bruce Lee's first film in 1971. You know, they'd seen him on the Green Hornet or whatever. This is his first big feature film. And when you pop that DVD in and the movie starts, it's the first thing you hear and it grabs you. And when I was watching the documentary, Motown, uh, what's it called? Uh, the Making of Motown. It's on Showtime. It just came out. It's brand new. Check it out if you can. Barry Gordy and Smokey Robinson are kind of the focal point of this thing. They're, they're narrating most of it. And they're talking about how they selected songs or singles from the hit factory Motown. And it was done by committee. And the way it worked is Smokey Robinson and several other writers, Ashford and Simpson and some other ones, would write songs and record them. And then there would be a group that sat around a board table. They'd listen to the songs and they'd decide if they were singles or not, if they were good or not. And one of the rules they had about anything that they put out there as a single is it had to grab you within the first 10 seconds, right? And the reason it had to grab you that quick was because Program directors and DJs might get bored and just move on to the next thing otherwise. Does that sound familiar to any of you? Think about Nick over here, our friend at Promo Only. By the way, who's a Promo Only subscriber? Okay, if you're not, shame on you. He's right there. He'll go talk to him. Okay, Nick's a good friend of mine. Nick's been to my home, you know, and uh, he'll hook you up. He'll even give you a trial, but you should check it out. But when we get our music, whatever music service you use, we kind of preview our tracks, right? And if it doesn't grab you right away, what do you do? You skip right over it, don't you? Next, I think about that when I'm programming music for my parties too. When I'm selecting a track to play out of an event like a wedding or whatever, I don't want to play a track that's boom, 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 for 30 seconds. I want to play something that's got a unique hook that people recognize. Or if they don't recognize it, it gets them excited and it gets them curious. And I felt like that song had a hook like that. And the reason I specifically picked that song is because I wanted Don to have to download something he didn't already own. I thought that would be fun. No, no. They only do Currents, and I think, what, 92? Yeah, 92 was the first promo only. That's from 1971. But I bet you if they were around in 1971, they'd have rocked that. I bet you. So some of you know me, some of you don't. And, and I, I see a lot of new faces here, which is cool. I go to a lot of these things all over the world. And uh, I, I see a lot of the same people. I see a lot of new people, and, and I like that. And I know that there are a lot of people here who don't really know who I am. 
And the reason I know that is because uh, last night, I believe, or the night before, perhaps, it was the night before, somebody said to me in the bathroom, oh, something's wrong with you physically. I thought you were drunk. And I just thought I would just address the pink elephant in the room. Yeah, eight years ago, I had a massive stroke, which caused a cognitive disorder in my brain. And uh, unfortunately, it affected the right side of my body. So just, I'm putting it out there. And I also want to say that I don't want to say anything today that upsets or offends or makes anyone uncomfortable, okay? But uh, if I happen to say anything that upsets, offends, or makes anyone uncomfortable, I got a medical excuse, okay? All right, you guys ready for this? All right, that none of that was planned, by the way, a rift. So what I wrote this on, and I have notes, is what do mobile DJs do anyway? The wedding edition. And what I wanted to do was think about how the general public thinks about us, right? Mobile DJ. Okay, I have to hire a mobile DJ. What is that? So let's break it down. Let's define it. The word mobile, I actually looked it up. And the definition is capable of moving or being moved readily. We all on the same page with that? Sound about right? Okay. DJ was a little harder. And I riffed on this one. Plays pre-recorded music. That's pretty much what a DJ does, right? Now, a professional DJ plays pre-recorded music in front of an audience be it the radio or live audience, right? You down with that? Now, what music does the DJ play? It depends. I think there are probably three different ways that we can look at the music the DJ plays. One way is that somebody else picks the music, right? Now, this could be via request or a list of songs the client gives you, right? And if that's the case, if someone else has picked all your music, and it could be a program director if you're a radio guy, sometimes what our job is is to pick the order these songs are played in. Sometimes, right? Are we on the same page here? Okay. So the other way that we can play music is we can pick the music. Now, I hate the phrase read the crowd. I don't like it. It sounds like industry jargon to me. It, I don't know what it sounds like to a client that I'm talking to when I say, yeah, I read the crowd, that's what I do. I think a better way to describe what we do is to say that we play to the audience because that's really essentially what we do and I think it's more descriptive then play to the crowd. That sounds like what one DJ might say to another, but I don't believe that that sounds like something that you should say to a client. I think playing to the audience is a little more descriptive. Now, I think most of us do a combination of both of those things. We play music that people have requested or asked for, and we play to the audience, right? We're doing a combination of those things. That's what I like to do. When I'm talking to a client in a meeting, I want to know what their musical personality is because I want to inject that into the evening. I want them to be represented in what I do. I don't want to just guess and pick. And what I try to do to make things a little more interesting, instead of having a client pick all their music, Let's say the client's into rock and roll. I don't need to know they like Poison and Def Leppard and ACDC and Warrant and White Snake and 10 other people. If you tell me you like Guns N' Roses, I can kind of work around that. You can too, right? Yeah? So that's how I like to do it. And I try to get maybe a list of a dozen songs, play around those songs. So I'm, I'm making their personality representative of what I'm doing that evening. And then I'm also taking the request from the audience and I'm picking some tracks too. Now, 
when we are playing to the audience and we're programming, which is essentially what this is, we're picking the songs to be played, there are several different ways we can do this as well, right? Looking at my notes. There are tried and true tracks that we know will work. Can anybody give me an example of a tried and true track? Get your hands up. Go to the mic, whatever you want. To do. Don't go and go on the mic yet. Just get your hands up. I can hear you. Anybody? Go ahead. Good. 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 Anybody else? Love Shack. That's where it's at. Yeah. Don't stop till you get enough. It takes two. Uh, shut up, John. John's always trying to get Huey Lewis in there any way he can. How many people do you know? How many people have you met in your lifetime who will tell you, yeah, my favorite band of all time is Huey Lewis and the News. I've never heard anybody say that but John Young. That's for you, baby. I know you tried, but what are you going to do, man? So, so those are like what I call the lexicon tracks. Those are the songs that everybody just kind of knows, right? And it doesn't matter if you're young or you're old, and what walk of life you come from, you know that track or, you, or those tracks. No, not Heart and Soul, the other ones. <laughs> what I like to do is try to find what I call common ground tracks which again are the songs that everybody kind of knows. So for instance, if, not that I have this much anymore because that whole generation really isn't going to my party as much anymore, but the 50s fans, remember the 50s fans, you older DJs? Yeah. Do you play a lot of 50s anymore? I totally don't, it's weird. I have a whole collection of music, by the way, for a, a, a generation that's dead. <laughs> I've got like ink spots and big band and World War II stuff. And yeah, I mean, nobody, gonna want, nobody wants to hear it anymore. They're gone or they can't dance anymore. One or the other. Sinatra. Now that's a really good, <laughs> Johnny. Now Sinatra's uh, interesting for a lot of reasons. And I'll riff, on, I'll riff on Frank Sinatra for a minute. First of all, everybody knows Frank Sinatra. Little kids know it because they're hearing it at the Italian restaurant, right? And then everybody else knows it because it's freaking Frank Sinatra. But uh, the thing about Frank Sinatra that drives me nuts, I love to play Frank Sinatra things like, uh, oh, I don't know, Fly Me to the Moon for a, for a dance. I think that's really nice. It's a nice song to play. People know it. They like it. What I hate is playing Frank Sinatra for dinner. I, I don't like it, and I'll tell you why I don't like it. Does anybody know what crescendo means? Raise your hand if you know what crescendo means. Crescendo, for those of you who don't know, crescendo is this when things are nice and quiet. And then they get loud, like out of nowhere. And that's really cool live. Like when you're listening to a big band, when it's really quiet, and then it jumps up. But it kind of sucks when you're trying to keep a low volume on your PA system and you got grandma 10 feet away from you, you give her a freaking heart attack. So... I try to discourage that for dinner, but it doesn't always work. People like what they like. They want what they want. You got to take care of them. But I discourage it if I can. Things like compressed music, which is what we have now where everything's kind of the same volume level. Michael Buble, you know, that's cool. Harry Connick Jr., uh, Nora Jones. All that new contemporary stuff is more compressed, and it's more dinner music friendly. So that I'd like to encourage. If they like what we call the pop standards, that's the kind of stuff I like to steer them towards instead of Sinatra. But I still have to play a lot of Sinatra because that's what I want. But anyway, the common ground tracks are the songs that, yeah, everybody knows them. So grandma knows them, uh, her grandson knows them, and her kids know them. And I can play that song and, and everyone's going to dance. Back to the 50s thing, for instance, someone could ask for, I don't know, Chantilly Lace or something, you know, and I could play it. But I'm going to get a better reaction from everybody if I play the twist, because that's a common ground 50 song. Do we agree with that? Yeah, so, so those are the common, well, technically it's like 61, 60 to 61, right? Yeah, it's where I'm from, uh, Milwaukee, which is the middle bit of the country, if you guys didn't know, just above Chicago. 
50s and 60s became one word. It was 50 sissy as a DJ. Do you have any 50 sissy? Yeah, sure, I have 50 sissy. So, <laughs> so what's constant thing? Um, songs based off requests. We do a lot of those, right? They ask for a song, you play it. Um, how do you guys feel about requests? Do you like playing requests? Yeah? Most of the time, right? right? It's a challenge, isn't it? Yeah, it's a request, not a demand. Exactly. The challenge with requests for me is, you know, I, I'm over here. You know, I'm, I'm doing like, uh, I don't know, Happy by Pharrell. And then they're asking for Back That Thing Up by Ludacris. And I got to somehow go from happy to back that thing up where it makes sense. That's tough sometimes, right? But that's also a challenge because I have to find those five songs that can bridge happy to back that thing up. And I think it's fun. And I have a guilty pleasure with requests. And I don't know if any of you guys do this or not, but I, I live for this, man. I like one-upping the request. You know what I'm talking about? I, I'll give you an example. A really popular request for my brides right now is NSYNC's Bye Bye Bye. You guys get that? It's that generation right now, the, the people getting married. Even if they were a little young when that song came out, they know it, they like it, and they were probably doing some dance routine to it in school with their friends. And, and I'm happy to play it, and I get the girls out there and they dance. But to me, a much better song from the same sort of time and, and space is Backstreet Boys, Everybody. Dude, I ain't gonna lie, that's my jam. I love that tune. So when I get a request for Bye Bye Bye, you better believe I'm gonna follow it up with everybody. And what happens? Everything elevates. It goes from here, which is okay, to here. And I love doing that. Just, just one helping the audience, you know? And it's almost my little way of subliminally saying, I appreciate your request, but I'm the freaking professional. Leave it up to me. Another one is, okay, is this just where I live or is this everywhere? You make my dreams come true by hollow notes. Did it make a comeback? Yeah, and it's like millennials, right? And I play it and I see people my age, and I'm 48 by the way, and, and older, a little confused. Because in the day when that song came out, it wasn't really that kind of jam, right? But they're dancing to it. Kind of like Toto's Africa. I mean, nobody danced to that. They liked it, but they weren't dancing to it. But millennials are dancing to it. I followed up with The Rich Girl by Hollow Notes. Which, by the way, that's 2 minutes and 22 seconds of bliss. I... That's, that's my, that's a perfect pop song. And it's only two minutes and 20 seconds. If you've ever timed it, that's the shortest little song, but it's so good. I love that track. I do it also with ABBA's Dancing Queen. You guys get requests for ABBA's Dancing Queen? Very lexicon song, right? What do you guys follow it up with? You could do that if you want. I go, Take a Chance on Me by ABBA. I do the two four. I'm big on the two fours. A lot of people don't really remember that song until you play it, and then it's like, oh, yeah. They either heard it in Mamma Mia movie or whatever, which the kids know, or they remember it. They're old like me, and they remember the song. So, again, brings ele elevates the level and the energy in the room on the dance floor. I'll give you one more example. Get Down Tonight, KC and the Sunshine Band. You get that request? You play it? What do you follow it up with? Okay. Okay. I'm a keep it coming love guy. Who remembers that song? That's one of those songs that most of you in this room forgot about. But if the DJ played it right now, you'd be like, oh, yeah, I remember that song. It's a much better song to get down tonight. I think. And, and I actually did a party a while back where I played it, and the intro of the song isn't like an exciting intro like we were talking about earlier. It's a little more uh, just... And some people were like, oh, and they were walking off the dance floor. 
I got on the microphone and I said, give it a minute. It gets better. I, I said that. And they looked at me funny. And as soon as it kicked in, sure enough, they stayed and their friends came out. So one-upping requests is just a hobby of mine. I love doing it. It's, it's fun as a music programmer. And um, I am a total music geek, if you haven't noticed already. Does anybody else talk about music up here today? Or, or yesterday during the conference? Did anyone else talk about music? You did? You weren't speaking, were you? No, so you don't count. Nobody talked about it. <laughs> Nobody talked about it, man. It, this is a DJ conference. DJs play music. We need to talk about music. Lights are interesting. Speakers are interesting. I love LD systems. I love Ape Labs. I, 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 Prom only. This is the guy that I enjoy talking to. Nick and I were talking a lot last night. And that's the kind of stuff we talk about. I mean, I, music is my thing. I do this because I love music. It's not because I like to uh, get out in front of people or play games or whatever. And if you do that, that's cool. My thing is just, I'm a music lover first. And that's why I got into this. And everything I do, everything I do at an event that I'm required to do, like the kind of things that we do other than play music, and you all know what those things are, are the things that I have to do. And the reward is I get to DJ at the end. That's, that's kind of the reward. It's kind of like eating your, your, your meal before you can have your ice cream. You know, DJing part for me is the ice cream. I love it. How about surprise, oh yeah, signature tracks? Do any of you guys do those? Does anybody have a signature track they play? Yeah, what do you got? <laughs> that is actually very cool. When do you play it, Nick? <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Okay, that's the exit song. Anybody play anything for dancing the signature? Okay, anybody else? <laughs> That's actually pretty awesome. Nice. Ooh, one of my favorite songs. Nice. My signature track, what, what, what would you guess my signature track would be? Yeah, no. Yeah, Huey Lewis. And I get a lot of, I, I, get, I get a lot of criticism for this, and I've gotten a lot of criticism on social media. And it's really easy to criticize people on social media, by the way, you bunch of pussies. But anyway, <laughs> say it to my face. Uh, Be Faithful, Fat Man Scoop, and Crooklyn Clan. That is my signature song. If my party is going well, if I think everybody's cool and happy, it, I will just go from, like, Love Will Keep Us Together from Captain and Tino right into it. I don't care. In, fa <laughs> in fact, I like the shock value. I like it that it's just such a, whoa, something changed. Heck yeah. Well, of course I play the edited version. <laughs> In fact, back to my friend Nick, promo only. This is, this is where you're going to get your edited versions of things. And, and it's, it, by the way, speaking of, this is nothing, not, nothing I'm talking about right now was even on my notes. I'm riffing. But I am not a moral cop when I do my events. And the reason I'm not is because it's not my job. I'm not here to tell people what they should and shouldn't listen to, what language they shouldn't and shouldn't hear. However, I will let the FCC decide. If it's good enough for radio consumption, it's good enough for my audience. Unless I'm doing a real conservative event and they say otherwise, those are my rules. So I don't play the unedited versions of songs if they're uh, colorful. But I will play radio edits, and I'll play whatever is approved. And that's, that's what you get with promo only. That's why I like that service. So anyway, the reason we're talking about all this stuff is because, you know, we've gone a little deep into it. But I think when we speak to anyone and tell them we're a mobile DJ, it's kind of what they're thinking about what we're doing, right? Well, he, he picks the stuff up, puts it in his truck, brings it to the venue, sets it up, and plays music. 
I, would you agree that that's pretty much what public perception is of what we do? You don't think that's public perception? What do you think it is? Yeah, right. Well, I agree that it's not what we do, but I think that's what public perception is. So let's have some fun. Let's talk about what we really do. Anybody? What do we do besides just show up and play music? Yeah, what else? I made a list right here. We MC events, right? Okay. We do sound system and lighting system design. Okay. System setup, loadout, and tech. Client consulting. Got to chill these chicks out, man. Brides are nuts, right? You got you to gotta let her know that everything's going to be okay and you got to earn her trust. You got to chill her out. You got to earn her trust. And his and her mom's and everything else. We're counselors, really, when it comes down to it. Um, organize events with timelines. Does everybody do this or is it just me? Okay. Um, coordinate with other vendors and the facility. Got to do that, right? Um, this is a new thing for me, and please raise your hand if you're doing this as well. I know some of you are, but a lot of you aren't. Uh, I just started directing wedding ceremonies where I go in for the rehearsal, and I actually tell them how to do everything because the officiant has no freaking clue anymore. Raise your hand if you're also doing this. So a few of you are doing this. This is brand new. I did my daughter's in August because she got married. And I wasn't planning on doing it, but I was at the rehearsal, and it was obvious no one knew what was going on. So I kind of took over. And I have done, like, three of them since then. So people keep asking me to do it. I don't even, like, mention that I do it. We don't know what we're doing. I wish we had some help with this. It's like, ah. do you want me to come? And Oh, that would be great. So now it's turned into a two-day gig, and i got to charge for that. But we're not talking about money today. But that's something else I'm doing. And I'm, why am I doing it? Because I kind of know how to do it. And it's not because I want to know how to do it. I've seen it done hundreds of times, as you have too. And it's not that hard. You just need to help me out a little bit. So, so I do that now. And uh, the other thing that we do sometimes, I know some DJs do it more than others, is that we're providing back-end support. And what that means is we're providing things to others like microphones for toasts and speeches and things, right? And we're also sometimes, I'm doing it sometimes, providing sound for musicians. Anybody do that too? Where you've got like, yeah, you've got a musician for a ceremony or a grand entrance or whatever. You've got to provide sound for them. Sometimes microphones. That's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, we're, we're like the sound guy now, right? So is there anything else you can think of that I haven't mentioned that we should point out? You, well, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that's ultimately what happens. But as far as job titles go, marketing, oh, yeah, absolutely. Now, with all those things in mind, what do we talk about? How many things do you figure? Like maybe 15 things? Different individual things that we do? How many other vendors do any of this stuff? Any wedding vendors? Photographers? The facility? The coordinator? Please raise your hand and let me know other vendors that will handle all these tasks. Ain't that a trip? We're the backbone of this stuff, guys. We're the ones doing this stuff. And I think we're being pretty modest about it with not only our rhetoric, but our pricing. And yeah, don't sell yourself shorts, guy. Don't don't sell yourself shorts. That would be like if you worked at Kohl's and you sold yourself a pair of shorts. No. Don't don't sell yourself shorts. There we go. Remember? 
What's this? Thank you. Speaking of other vendors and other professions, can you think of another profession that's similar to ours? Like, what's the most similar profession to what we do? Can, can you think of anything? Event planner? Concierge? A band? Anyone else? Here's the one I got. Stand-up comedians. Anybody feel me on that? Do I need to explain it? Yes. I like how he said that. He said that in his FM radio voice from the 70s. Yes. All right, check it out. They gig. They're at a different place every night. Timing is huge for comedians. It's a big deal. It's not what they say. It's how they say it. It's pauses. It's playing to the audience. I uh, recently saw a interview, or I guess it was a roundtable. Louis C.K., if you know who he is, comedian. And Jerry Seinfeld was there along with Ricky Gervais and Chris Rock. And they were thinking back to when they were, you know, kind of honing their craft. And, and one question that Louis C.K. had for Jerry Seinfeld was, when I'm doing a bit and I get a big laugh, like a big laugh, and it lasts for a second, what do I do during that laugh? I don't know what to do, right? Do I interrupt? Do I do something else? Jerry said, freeze in the moment. So, for instance, let's pretend you were going to laugh at what I'm about to say. I would make this gesture and freeze and not move and wait for the laughter to subside and then carry on. Now, how can I apply that to being a mobile DJ? The first dance. That's the first thing I thought about. When I play that first dance song, the couple's dancing, the song comes to an end. What I used to do is say, all right, everybody, give a big round of applause. First dance is a married couple, Betty and Tom. I don't do that anymore. I do this. I make eye contact with somebody in the audience, and I do this, make sure they start clapping, and they do. And when they start clapping, the couple hugs, and then the clap swells. And I don't make a noise, don't play any music, don't say a word, and I let that moment happen. That's cool. That's cooler than what I used to do. Sometimes silence is best. We don't always have to be there, you know, trying to make this moment happen. Sometimes you got to just let a moment happen and let them enjoy it. So we're, a lot of people say our job is to create memories. That's a memory. Somebody's got that on video. Somebody's got a picture. And, you know, if we could find it in our hearts to shut the hell up for a minute, we can let them have it. So, um, the other thing they talk about is bombing, right? So how many of you have found a great song and it's the first time you've ever played it? You played it at an event and everybody goes nuts. It's like, okay, this is a hot new song, right? And you play it the next week and nobody cares. And they look at you like you're insane. It happens, right? It happens to comedians all the time too because they'll do a set one place one night the next night, they'll do a set somewhere else, and nobody cares. I heard Jay Leno talking about how he hates corporate events because it's typically like a bunch of guys or a bunch of sports fans or whatever. He likes playing for an audience that's diverse. He likes playing for young and old and men and women and all walks of life because that way, all the jokes that he does, he can do a joke and, and aim it towards the women. And the guys might get a laugh out of it. And so will the women. They can play off of each other that way. You know? What did that make me think of? How there's no way in hell I'd ever DJ at a DJ event. Never. I have no interest in DJing for you guys. I'm sorry. I love you. But there's no way I'd ever DJ for a bunch of DJs. Because y'all just stand there like this. How many DJs does it take to screw in a light bulb? (laughs) 
This is coming from a guy that didn't understand why. The captain of the ship didn't like it that he played the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald White while on Lake Michigan. He had no idea why that was a problem. <laughs> All the DJs, and this is why, it takes one DJ to get a light bulb out of the cupboard, get a ladder, set it up, climb up on the ladder, take the old light bulb out, put the new light bulb in, and pull the switch. And every other DJ in the world stands around the ladder. I could do that. Ben's got a bigger laugh than mine did, though. <laughs> See, I heard that one for sound guys. I heard that that was the punchline for the sound guys. Or the guitar players, one or the other. <laughs> okay, so we are going to go back to performance for a minute. We talked about the music we play, how we select it, and all the other duties that we do, including him sing. Um, so here's a question. Are we the star of the show? Are we the co-star of the show? I learned that a long time ago. When did you figure out that you weren't the star of the show, Frank? <laughs> huh? I figured out I wasn't the star of the show when I was seven years old, before I was a DJ. And that's when I really liked what the DJ did. I, I looked at what he was doing, and I say he because it was a gentleman I was looking at um, when I was seven. I said, yeah, I kind of want to do that. It was when I saw Saturday Night Fever. It came out when I was seven years old. Well, actually, I was six, but I saw it when I was seven. And I noticed something that was pretty crazy. The DJ was the one who was playing all those hot tracks, right? He was picking all the songs. And I think the DJ got on the microphone like one time and said, hey, man, dig that polyester look. And that's all he said, right? None of the dancers was hanging out with him after the club. You know, he wasn't a part of the gang. Nobody was talking to him unless they wanted something from him. He was kind of in a different dimension almost. He wasn't the star of the show. The star of the shows were the dancers, obviously. John Travolta, you know, oh, it's the star of the show. Uh, the co-star, I believe, are the artists that are performing the tracks that we're playing. That would be the co-stars. You know, in that case, it was Donna Summer and, you know, Traveris and Casey and the Sunshine Band or whatever. Um, so who the hell is the DJ? If we're not the star and we're not the co-star, what are we? Ringleader. What else? Director. Equipment operator. I, uh, I'm going with facilitator of events. That's what we do. And, okay, any Latinos? You got Latinos here today? Couple? Okay, my wife is Puerto Rican, and I met her salsa dancing. Before this crap happened to me, I could actually dance. And there's a thing with salsa dancing, and it might sound sexist to some of you, but it's, it's, it's not. It's a dance thing. In salsa dancing, when the man and woman are dancing together, his job as a dancer is to make her look good. That's his only job. He's not supposed to show up. He's not supposed to be flashy. She has a beautiful dress on. Uh, she's got the heels on. She's got the big smile on. The guy is usually in darker uh, clothes, more muted. We're paying attention to her, not him. His job is to make her look good. And that's what I do as a DJ. I want to make everybody else look good. That's right, facilitator of events. Now, I would like to open the mic up for questions. Anybody? Oh, crap. <laughs> Don't be shy. Okay, you go first. Yeah, no, I'm not using any of the words that we use. So, Brian, uh, some of your musical, you have unusual 
musical tastes and some of different artists and such that many of us wouldn't expect are kind of on your favorite list of your personal favorites. Share a little bit of the personal favorites for those who haven't heard you talk about some of those, if you would, please. We mean some of the stuff that I just like? Some of the stuff, some of the artists and things. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, I could go through and name a bunch of them, but... But you don't know them. Well, you do, because I've told you. Yeah, exactly. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, I like all kinds of stuff. I, I like 70s disco. I like 80s music. I like rock. Uh, currently, my, my thing is yacht rock. Does everybody know what yacht rock is? That's my joint right now, and, and I'll tell you why. It, well, for those of you who don't, raise your hand if you do not know what Yacht Rock is, by the way. Just go ahead and get your hand up. Okay, you do, you know what Yacht Rock is? Yacht Rock is like, it's, yeah. Anything Michael McDonald's ever sang, <laughs> Kenny Loggins, Ambrosia, you get the vibe, right? Some Doobie Brothers, some of that stuff. And, and the reason Yacht Rock was my joint right now is because I've been working on a, uh, my father's car for the last oh, over a year now. I'm in the shop a lot. I got one arm. I'm wrenching on the thing. I can't get pissed off and throw a wrench when I'm listening to Kenny Loggins. <laughs> it's just impossible. If I was listening to, like, some hip-hop or if I was listening to some rock and roll, you know, give me some energy, I might break a window. But it keeps me calm, so I listen to that. Go ahead. I'm a little taller, so I had to adjust it. You're Batman. I am Batman. I heard you tell us all about it last night. Yeah. My question is, uh, how much um, emceeing do you do at the wedding? What I mean, talking, involvement. Sure. Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. Thank you for it. I turn the mic on when I have something to say. I turn the mic off when I don't. It's, I hate filler. And I'm trying not to give you any filler today because I respect your time. So, yeah, that's, that's what I do. I try to make it as brief as possible. I try to do my um counts. I am probably said um a few times up here, but it's pretty interesting. If you guys are public speakers, record yourself talking, figure out how many times you say um, and make yourself feel bad about it and, and guilt yourself into not doing that anymore, it helps. Go ahead, Howie. Okay. Um... I uh, I moderate your show. One. And, uh, no, that was, wait, I, there's only one, wait a minute. Now, I do a lot of the moderating when, when you're doing your show, and I noticed that uh, when you're talking music, people are Googling, and you're faster than Google. <laughs> so I need some help. Um, I had someone ask me for the Cuban Shuffle, and I can't find it. Yeah, nice, huh? Yeah, did you guys get that? They make up their own titles for as long as they want. And we got to be the music detective. I'm going to tell you a story. Back in the 80s, I was in high school. My mom is very cool, by the way. She's 78 years old. She's super cool. Like, her favorite artist right now is Rune 5. I mean, that's her favorite, favorite artist. And uh, I came home from school one day, and she says... I heard a great song on the radio. I love it. I'm like, what song was it? I can't say. Why not? It's a dirty word. I'm not comfortable saying that. I'm like, oh, come on, Mom. They're playing it on the radio. How bad can it be? What song do you hear? <sighs> okay. It was called Pussy. I said, What? <laughs> Yeah, push it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Isn't that great? Yeah, yeah. I misunderstand words all the time, too. For years, I thought the uh, song Operator by Jim Croce was about a burrito. A burrito? I didn't know. <laughs> Go ahead. I love the music shows when you and John talk about all these different ones. I'm mean, talking about the transitions from getting that five song transition. Yeah. What I would like to know with audience participation is the two most obscure songs. And I would like you to go from that one obscure song to the other obscure song in those five choices. Oh my God, this is like six degrees of Kevin Bacon. With, <laughs> with your thought process as to how it would get there. 
So, with the first one, what would be the okay, first song? Okay, okay, so we're playing a game now. It's like st This is like Stump the DJ, the DJ no, edition. No, you are so good at this. I, not I that good. I would love to go ahead and hear your thought process. There's no right answers. There's only the answers. So go ahead. What's your first song? What's the first song? Where are we at right now? Okay, we're doing I Walk the Line by Johnny Cash. Johnny Cash. What do we need to get to? We're going to get to. Want to be by Spice Girls? Okay. Cool. I can do this pretty quick, I think. So we're on country. We're on old country. We go Elvira Oak Ridge Boys, right? Okay. Let's see. And then we could go probably Shania Twain because that's country. We'll go Any Man of Mine. And then we can go – and that, now we're on a dance beat, right? So we're in the girl genre. We're on the country genre. Now we can go – Oh boy, let's see. Where do we go? Road or no, 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 no. Let's 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 go save a horse ride a cowboy. That would be fun because that's like a group active song. You could definitely you could go Taylor Swift, you know. But I'm trying to think country crossover here. Yeah, you could totally just do it right there. Something I just want to just just say, that, and this is my style. By the way, nothing I said today is gospel. This is all my opinion. And this isn't me preaching. I'm not a preacher. I'll just kind of tell you what works for me, my thoughts and ideas. If you have a different opinion, we're still friends. I mean, that's that's, that's how it's supposed to work. So, um, yeah, what what I don't believe is that we always have to make this transition like, like, like we're suggesting. And sometimes we do have to make the transition. Sometimes I think it's more interesting just to kind of just not just just, yeah, wake them up. And, and that's what I was talking about with the Kirkland clan song, you know, be faithful. I mean, if we're rocking out to happy and all of a sudden I play be, be faithful, people take notice. So, whoa, what was that? If I'm beat mixing all night, they're almost in a trance. They know it's going to be boom, 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 into something else. But if I, I do something abruptly, it, it kind of shocks them. They pay attention. They're at attention. They're listening. And I might even bring them out. So it's okay sometimes to do that. Sorry, go ahead. So I have two questions. They're, they're brief. One question is, well, for you and for everybody in the room, mm. what is the easiest way to identify like all of the lyrics of songs so that way it's a lot easier? So if somebody comes up and says, well, I, I want the song Apple Bottom Jeans, you know it's low by flow Rider. Because sure, that's sure. happened to me like a dozen times. Yeah. First question. So how, how do I do that? I guess I'm just trying to pay attention. And, and being a guy who's done misunderstood song lyrics myself, I have empathy for him. I, I get it. I, I, sometimes, you know, I, I would have guessed maybe it was called Apple Bottom Jeans, too, until I, you know, saw it on my promo-only, you know, thing, so. But are there, like, any websites you can go to that are, you can really look at all the lyrics? Because if you go on, like, Google and you type in lyrics, wouldn't there be sometimes different versions where, like, karaoke, for example, I've yeah. seen a couple uh, tracks where two or three of the words are not the same in one track and they're different in another, like, there are a lot of songs like that where sometimes it, it happened more in the older music, I think, where there were alternate verses and songs on the album version and things like that. Mm. Um, I, I will say that, yeah, you can Google it. Sometimes even under the YouTube videos, it'll give you uh, the lyrics. Sometimes they're very wrong, but they're there. And, and what I will also just say is, you know, sometimes a lot of us just pick it up. We all have our strong points. Lou Paris is up here talking about websites, and my brain exploded. I, <laughs> I, can't, I can't do it. Uh, he's really good at that, okay? He's also a great DJ as well. But uh, So he, he's got two things going for him. This is what I do best. So I kind of have an unfair advantage there, but I kind of suck at everything else. So if that's any consolation. Okay, so the other one was, how do you handle when uh, banquet managers or somebody else is coming up to you at an event and asking for, uh, for you to say something or do something like, oh, somebody forgot the keys or somebody lost something. Uh -huh. Do you how do you, do you politely tell them, hey, can you give me a couple minutes and I'll, I'll fit that in, or do you just literally stop the song, say it, and then people get pissed off and they're like, we're dancing. I, yeah, good question. I think that's when I turn into a radio DJ and I'll say, sure, yeah, just give me a second, and then on the intro of the next song, I'll try to get those words out before the chorus pops into the or before the the, the lyrics pop in, just like the radio DJs used to do. You remember that back in the old days? You know, they, they'd play a song with a long intro, and they'd just start riffing really fast. And they'd always, like, end right when the lyrics started, or right when, um, you know, right on the one when the hook started. Um, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. 
Yeah, so. Uh, oh, it's you. Yeah, it's Jesus. me. So, uh, <laughs> two, one, one question and one, one, one statement okay. and one question. Statement would be, I remember when you and my son met, if I'm sure you'll recall, it was at uh, Marquis Show two mm -hmm. years ago, the first Marquis Show. Ian was at the time 17, I believe, and you started talking about some obscure album by Daft Punk, which I still don't remember the name of. Was it Discovery? Probably Discovery, yeah. Yeah, okay. That was, and you did some kind of breakdown with 20. The, the biggest album they ever had, their obscure one, with Discovery, yeah. Uh, to me, it was obscure. Well, of course. Because I just yeah. don't know, right? So, but the 17-year-old kid instantly gravitated to you, and you two had an hour-long conversation about that album and what it meant and the, the build-up on it. It was, it was amazing to me. And then, over a year later... You know, after after the second uh, marquee show, we visited you, and you two got into this rift down in the cave, and I'm like, this guy just knows his friggin' music, man. It's it's one, it's a wonderful listen. You don't take compliments well, but from somebody that is a neophyte when it comes to that, you're on a different level, and I just I really appreciate that, and I thank you for sharing it. Thank you, but yeah. you know, you can yeah. program an iPad. You can you can use your phone. These are things I can't do. <laughs> So fair enough, fair enough. we all have our strengths and weaknesses, but thank you. Yeah, yeah my, 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 my next uh, comment is a question. Yes. That microphone sounds really good. What Doesn't is it? that microphone? Yeah, I'm using a different mic than everybody else used. Do you like it? Does what it sound is good? that? No, do you guys like this mic? Okay, this is the LD Systems U300. It's over there. And I've been using this mic now all summer because the mic I had was a good mic, but... I think it had too many drops at my events, yeah. and it started cutting out. At first, I thought it was an interference problem, and then I realized that it was actually something was shaking around in there. <laughs> so, so I thought I'd try this one, and it's great. This is a good mic. I've never had any problems with it, even in the city. I live right in the city of Milwaukee, which, if you don't know, uh, again, it's the middle bit just above Chicago. Um, we, it's not just happy days. We've got, like, you know, modern stuff there, too. So... <laughs> Uh, it, there are areas, I, I live right by downtown, by the way, too. I'm right in the city. Some people say they live in, you know, like a city, like, oh, I live in New York, and they really live like 30 miles outside of it. Nope, I'm in the city. So there are areas where there's a lot of, you know, air traffic with frequencies and things, and it's giving me no problem. So it's a good mic, and it's here. And there's more mics they have that are coming out that you should check out. They've got a mic coming out. Actually, it just came out. I have it, but I haven't done a video on it yet. And it's kind of a cool solution for you guys who want to do a guest mic for toast and things. It's like a $200 mic, but it's, it's, that's the one I'm using. Oh, I thought I was using the better one. No, I'm using, I'm using the $200 one. That's cool. Yeah. So you can 200 bucks for this thing, man. And it sounds good. So, oh, and the mic stands dope too. That's, that's gravity. So you're welcome. Hey man, we all have writers, you know? Anybody else? I respect your time, and just like a teacher that's your favorite, I'm going to let you out of class early today. Uh, please take some time and talk to the vendors. Also take some time to talk to each other and, and get in groups if you'd like to and, and have jam sessions and, and learn from each other because that's why we're here, right? Thank you all so much for your time. Take care.